Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason, and welcome to APUSH. Today, we're just going to do a short overview of some of the technological changes that happened in the first half of the 19th century and how these changes helped transform American history. So we're going to see uh, some of this stuff. We're going to talk about some of these pieces and then how this facilitated westward expansion. And then we're going to do some reading of abolitionist arguments in order to help sort of see how the argument about slavery has changed over time. So first, we get, uh, we get new inventions, which is going to help facilitate and expand agriculture in the United States. A guy named John Deere is going to create a steel center draft plow, which is both uh, more durable and more flexible. So it can uh, not get destroyed by rocks and effectively cut through the prairie topsoil of the Great Plains, opening up huge swaths of the country to agricultural development. Up until this point, it was not necessarily economically feasible to farm out on the Great Plains because the prairie topsoil was just so difficult to uh, get through that uh, it would take too much effort in order to uh, make the farm productive. But with this center draft plow, we're then going to open up more of the country to, again, agricultural production, helping to facilitate westward expansion and, of course, leading to new issues with Native Americans, the expansion of slavery, stuff like that. McCormick's is go McCormick is also going to create a, a mechanical harvesting machine, which is going to significantly increase the amount of acreage that one person can harvest. And so this is going to both lead to larger farms out in the West and also a decrease in demand for farm labor, which is going to help facilitate the urbanization and move to cities and the industrialization that's going to happen in the run up to the Civil War. So all of those things are going to connect together. At the same time, we're going to see new new developments in transportation. Uh, clipper ships are going to make transatlantic travel safer, faster, and more reliable. And the invention of the steam engine and its importation to the United States is, of course, going to significantly increase uh, the reliability, speed, and effectiveness of transportation. Hopefully, we're familiar with the steam engine. Uh, probably the most famous early steam engine is Peter Cooper's Tom Thumb, shown here. Again, you've got a boiler which creates steam, moves a piston. That piston then is able to turn wheels and, you know, the steam engine goes. So you're turning heat into motion. Uh, there was a famous race between Tom Thumb and a horse in order to demonstrate the effectiveness of this new steam engine. Because Tom Thumb could go at a regular 15 miles per hour, Tom Thumb pulled out ahead of the horse, but then the engine broke down. The horse won the race. But it's still established that if they could build a reliable steam engine, they could consistently outperform horses and railroads were definitely going to be the thing of the future. In the 1830s, you've only got like the B&O, the Baltimore to Ohio Railroad and some of these small railroad companies. But by the 1840s, you can see railroads significantly expanding. And by the 1850s, you're starting to connect a significant portion of the country together through railroads. This, of course leads to the type of moral hazards that we, uh, you know, that we have every time new technology comes out. So there's this fear that uh, railroads are going to be absolutely deadly, that they're going to run over and kill all these people, and that, you know, they're going to be the downfall of American society. So, and push back the whole nimbyism, you know, well, yes, we like railroads, but not in my backyard, because, you know, I don't want my children to get run over by a train, etc. We also get the development of new types of information. Uh, we had previously talked about the penny press, this sort of cheaply produced newspapers that are going to significantly increase newspaper circulation, increase literacy, increase the passing of information, stuff like that. But Samuel Morse is also going to invent his telegraph. And so we're going to start seeing during this time period telegraph lines and instantaneous communication spreading across the United States. And so that's also going to speed the rate in which people can coordinate, pass ideas around, and things like that. And John Quincy Adams is going to finally be able to kill the gag rule, which is going to allow further discussion over slavery and uh, the growth of abolition during this time period. After fighting for uh, almost a solid decade against the gag rule, John Quincy Adams leads a coalition of of pretty much all the Whigs and Northern anti-slavery Democrats to get rid of the gag rule. And so the transportation, or so the information revolution is now going to include a lot of abolitionist tracts and arguments about slavery, which we're gonna read at the end of this class. At the same time, we've also got unrest in Europe leading to huge amounts of immigrants coming to the United States. 
We see a significant uptick in the amount of immigrants showing up between 46 and 51, both because of the Irish potato famine. So we see lots of people coming in from Ireland, but also a huge wave of immigration from Germany because of the revolutions of 1848, the failed Frankfurt Parliament, the first failed uh, wave of German, the first failed wave of German uh, unification and the first wars of Italian unification, starting to see people coming from different places, which is going to lead to an uptick in nativism. A lot of these people coming in were Catholic. And so there's this fear that Catholics are coming in to take over the country and this sense that, well, you know, these Irish people are just so different from us. There's really no effective way to integrate them into American society. They're just too foreign. And so we should uh, do our best to stop them from coming in here, lest they take us over and, you know, destroy American culture, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll end with the discussions of the election of 1848. 1848 was, of course, the race to try to get Zachary Taylor to be your presidential candidate. Uh, as we talked about last time, Zachary Taylor is a popular general. He's got a nickname, Old Rough and Ready, and he is totally apolitical. So he was 100 percent happy to, you know, he could have represented either party. He ends up going with the Whig party and he basically refuses to discuss anything about the election refuses to answer anyone's questions, uh, refuses to adopt a party platform, refuses to, you know, engage in campaigning at all. Uh, he's also criticized by the Democrats for all the Mexicans he killed in the Mexican-American War. But as we saw with Tippecanoe and Tyler II in 1840, that's not necessarily an attack that's going to stick to him. The Democrats are going to go with Lewis Cass of Michigan. He's a newcomer to this whole thing. And he's going to come up with a way to deflect questions about slavery by arguing that the people living in the territories themselves should be able to decide whether or not slavery is allowed there. So Lewis Cass comes up with this idea of popular sovereignty, or well, he called it squatter sovereignty, but we're eventually going to call it popular sovereignty because it sounds better. And this is his way to deflect questions about slavery because he says, well, I don't, I clearly don't have any opinions about slavery. I think the people in the territory should be able to decide this. And then whoever's listening to him can, you know, take their own beliefs and sort of and interpret that however they will. So seems like a reasonable attack. But the problem for the Democrats is Martin Van Buren is going to run as a third party candidate. He's going to run for this new party called the Free Soil Party, which is trying to unify together anti-slavery Democrats who don't want slavery to expand with abolitionist Whigs who are trying to get rid of slavery altogether. And so he's going to join with the son of John Adams, Charles Adams, you know, sorry, the son of John Quincy Adams, Charles Adams, who's an abolitionist, and attempt to run on this anti-slavery platform. Here he is trying to bridge the distance between free soilers and abolitionists. And of course, this cartoonist seems to have, seems to believe that that is not possible. Obviously, the spoiler effect is going to play a role here. The real question is, is Van Buren going to siphon off more votes from Zachary Taylor, because the Whigs tend to be a party that is more abolitionist than the Democrats? Or is he going to siphon off more votes from Lewis Cass, because, because uh, Martin Van Buren was a former Democrat? And so here's your, and so the election is clearly going to be stolen or affected by the red fox of Kinderhook here. Here he is stealing the election, which I guess is a goose. In this, uh, in this cartoon. But the question is, who is he going to steal it from? And so as we look at this map, it's clear he does get 10% of the vote, which is pretty substantial, but he's going to steal more votes from Lewis Cass, tipping the election to Zachary Taylor. And so Zachary Taylor is going to become our president going forward, and we'll pick up with him as he tries to navigate all of the issues associated with slavery and, uh, and tries to figure out a compromise for the whole Mexican session thing. So that's where we'll pick it up for next time. You've got a variety of different uh, abolitionist, abolitionist texts to read and interpret. So, uh, so that's your, that'll be your homework for tomorrow. Thank you for listening.